day we're continuing on with our topic of grace and justification that we began with a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is part of my lengthy series of educational homilies. Uh, there's a whole playlist of them on my YouTube page. And uh, after tonight, I will combine all the episodes of this topic, grace and justification, together into one episode if you just want to listen to it straight through. Uh, if you recall, last time I said that <clears throat> this one topic of grace and justification can be seen as the root cause <clears throat> of all the theological differences between Catholics and basically every other Christian. Uh, so uh, last time we went over the basics and nailed down some definitions, like the meanings of words like grace and salvation and justification. And this week I want to demonstrate those definitions by explaining them through history and through the words of scripture. So let's talk about history first. Historically, the first major change in uh, any Christian's understanding of grace and justification came during the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. There were a few major players, but the biggest of these was, of course, Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran Church. And these changes mainly stemmed from Martin Luther's hatred for the sale of indulgences. So indulgences are a thing still to this day. Um, you can receive them quite easily, in fact. Uh, but what they are, they're special types of prayers or good actions that you can do specifically to, to aid a soul in purgatory. And you can, uh, you can obtain an indulgence in many different ways by praying the rosary or the Stations of the Cross or uh, praying in a cemetery or visiting a holy site. Lots of things, hundreds of things, in fact, that you can do to specifically intercede for the poor souls in purgatory. It can even be your own soul uh, and apply that grace uh, to your soul in the future if you uh, happen to find yourself in purgatory. And the promise that, or the problem that Martin Luther had uh, with the indulgences was that back in the 14th and 15th, uh, 1500s, indulgences were being sold by corrupt church officials who were preying on people's superstitions and their devotion. And so people essentially took that to mean that you could literally buy your way into heaven. Uh, and so that's what they attempted to do, and you can see why that's a problem. So Martin Luther's anger was warranted, it was justified, but his response was extreme. Instead of fighting uh, corruption from within the church, he and many others broke away from the church entirely. And so in the 1520s, so this is literally three quarters uh, into the history of the church, uh, Martin Luther was the first person to propose the idea that we get into heaven uh, sola fide, which is Latin for English uh, by faith alone. That's how we get into heaven. God's pardon for guilty sinners is granted to and received through faith, and that's it, uh, not works. Luther taught that no human action, including indulgences, leads to our salvation. Only faith in God can save us. Instead, Luther said that justification happens by God simply covering up our sins. The image that he used was that the soul that was justified by God uh, was a dung heap that was now covered in snow. Those are his exact words. On the inside, in other words, we are still sinners, uh, but God covers us in his grace and makes us appear good in his eyes. What a lovely image uh, of the human person that Martin Luther had. And in fact, he took this to the extreme. He said that, uh, Luther said that nothing we do as human beings actually has any merit when it comes to our salvation. Luther said, yes, it's nice to do good things, but it cannot in any way be associated with our salvation, uh, our redemption. And so by removing the, necessary, the necessity to do good things, to do good works, Martin Luther also removed some major elements of the Catholic faith. He got rid of the mass, he got rid of the priesthood, confession, anointing of the sick, praying for the dead, uh, the idea of purgatory, and of course, indulgences. The real irony, though, with Martin Luther is that Saying that your entire salvation depends on your faith is actually putting all of the credit on you, uh, which uh, I think is what he was trying to avoid in the first place. But Martin Luther based most of his teachings on a single passage uh, from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans 3.28, which says, For we account a man to be justified by faith without the works of the law. Now, the mistake that many people make, including Luther, is that St. Paul is talking about the law when, when he's talking about this. He's talking about the Old Testament law, things like 
uh, the ritual cleansing laws, the laws regarding animal sacrifice and all the dietary laws. Um, those were all important things. They all have their place in the history of our salvation. Uh, but Paul is, is not arguing that. What Paul is saying is that we don't receive salvation from the law. We get it from God as an undeserved gift. Now, you can see how this stripped out version of Christianity kind of leads to where Christianity is today, at least in the United States, uh, where a lot of people say that all that matters is if you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and your ticket is punched for heaven. Um, when you think of the entire faith in that way, basically you're either justified or you're not. Um, it's all or nothing. There can't be a growth or a lessening of grace or your relationship with God in a person's life if it's all or nothing. I talked about this last time about how this view has basically led to all of the differences between Catholics and non-Catholics. If your relationship with God is all or nothing, then there's no need for the sacraments or for the church or for any sort of devotion like the rosary or the Divine Mercy Chaplet. If your relationship with God is all or nothing, why would you need the help? The problem with that is that no relationship, at least no healthy relationship, is all or nothing. It's not realistic. It's not real life. Instead of cherry picking from St. Paul's letters, let's look at the whole Bible and let's see what it has to say about this topic. So let's start with the letter of St. James. Uh, Martin Luther did not like the letter of St. James. He called it the letter of straw. Uh, and he even tried to have it removed from the Bible along with about 20 other books of the Bible. And the reason he doesn't like this is because St. James says this in his letter. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone might say, you have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. Now, those are pretty direct words. They're words that can't really be understood in any other way. And so in a couple of sentences, St. James destroys the idea of faith alone. Faith always, in the scriptures, has to be accompanied by good works. Um, if you look through all the scriptures, look at the words of Jesus himself. Do you ever find him saying, um, you know, what you do doesn't matter as long as you have faith in me. It, he doesn't say that, not once. And for people that claim to be all about the Bible, I don't understand how they can come to that conclusion. In fact, Jesus almost always says the opposite. He is almost always telling us that our actions do, in fact, matter. He's almost always saying that our salvation does depend upon our actions. Not that we earn our salvation through our actions, but whether we're saved or not, depends on the kind of person that we are. Uh, he's almost saying that people are hypocrites because their actions do not match their so-called faith. So here's just a couple of instances of Jesus himself shooting down this silly idea of faith without works. So here's Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So loving God and our neighbor, do those just happen in your mind? Is that just a decision that is about your faith? No, uh, they don't automatically happen if we simply state that Jesus is our personal Lord and Savior. Serving God and our neighbor requires us to take action, and Jesus is demanding this. Uh, I think we know uh, that this is something he says over and over again. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 21. Teacher, what, must, what good must I do to, eat, to gain eternal life? He answered him, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all of these things I observed, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, then sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. Well, that makes it pretty clear as well. What was the original question that the young man asked? He said, teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? In other words, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus' response is not have faith in me. His response is to do good, to obey the commandments, to give what you have to the poor. We have to do something in order to achieve eternal life. Those things are called good works. 
Uh, I've got even more if you want to hear it, as if you had a choice. Um, <laughs> let's go to Matthew 16, 24. Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Once again, if you want to be followers of Christ, we have to actually do something. Here's the most convincing one for me. This is chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. So not only did Jesus never say that faith alone would supplant all good works and obedience to God's laws, he in fact says that if we don't connect our faith with good works, it will result in our damnation. What is the destiny of those on the left who, who did not help their neighbor? It's not like they just got a strong talking to. Uh, they literally end up in hell. Jesus' message in the Gospels tells us that if we truly believe in Christ, we will obey his commandments and serve our neighbors. So to summarize, this is what we believe as Catholics regarding grace and justification. First of all, we do not earn our salvation. It is a free gift from God, won for us by Jesus dying for us on the cross. Uh, second, and very importantly, we are not snow-covered dung heaps. Uh, sin is not covered up or concealed, but it is literally cleansed away by the purification of sanctifying grace. Thus, a justified person is truly and actually made holy and pleasing in God's eyes. Uh, God doesn't just sort of look the other way when we commit sin. He completely destroys sin. He gives us his life. He gives us the grace to actually be perfect. To say otherwise would be to really place a lot of limitations on what God is able to do. Would you rather believe in a God who covers up your sins and act like they aren't there? Or would you rather believe in a God who can actually take your sins away, destroy them, and make you into something beautiful? Third, good works are necessary. This is quite clear from the scriptures. Jesus and his apostles say so. Good works are not meant for our glorification, but for the glorification of God and for, the, for serving others. St. Augustine described good works in this way. He says, God is glorified in the assembly of his holy ones, for in crowning their merits, he is crowning your own gifts. In other words, uh, God gives us the ability to do good so that we might glorify him. We must never believe that God owes us something for the good that we do, but rather we give glory to him in our actions. And those actions are necessary for growth in our relationship with God. And once we understand this, the things that we experience in our life take on a new meaning, even bad things uh, in life. There's uh, St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. Uh, every time I, I read this line, I think to myself, what does a non-Catholic think when they read this? St. Paul says, now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am willing, I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. Now, does this mean that Christ's redemption was lacking somehow? I'm filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, or that his suffering is somehow inadequate for the redemption of the world? Of course not. But we know that through our baptism, we are part of the mystical body of Christ. And Jesus Christ, the head of the body, asks us to participate not only in all the good things, the resurrection and grace, but also in his suffering and in his passion. And that's what we're talking about when you hear a Catholic say something like, offer it up. We're sharing in his passion. Um, when we say offer it up, it's Jesus takes all the pain and hardship that we experience and he asks us to give it to him. That's what we call redemptive suffering. Uh, and this is perhaps one of the most beautiful parts of our faith, that even death and heartache and loneliness and emptiness can be given over to God and transformed, which isn't possible if you don't believe in good works. Even the darkest places and moments in history, God can shed his light, and it's all possible because our actions have meaning just as much as our faith.